Hello, everybody. Last week, I released a very simple video of a song I wrote and recorded you know, 15 years ago or so. It's called Dark Night of the Soul, and uh, the poem that the song derives from uh, is a 16th century poem that's written by uh, St. John of the Cross. This is an example of what they would call mystical verse, and St. John used the metaphor of romantic love to describe our soul's relationship to God as one of, of um, lover and beloved. It's lovely. Um, do, doing the video kind of reanimated my interest in the song and the poem, and it sent me scurrying back to my books, and, and as I was kind of reading and, and getting back into the very things that inspired the song in the first place, I found myself wishing I could talk to Bruce Hindmarsh. And Bruce is a dear friend of mine. He's a, he's a professor at Regent College, a professor of spiritual theology and Christian history. And he's taught um, and thought deeply about uh, this particular poem. So I thought I need to call him to talk about this a little bit. And then I just thought, well, if I'm going to talk to him anyways, why not record it and make it available to anybody who's interested? So that's what's coming. Oh, over the next 45 minutes, you'll see a conversation that uh, Bruce and I have. Um, uh, immediately though you're going to see about 30 seconds of the song just to kind of get you into it and then we'll put up the whole song at the end and so if you want to skip ahead and familiarize yourself with it you can but otherwise I hope you enjoy it I really enjoyed the conversation with Bruce um, it's a great poem and, and worth worthy of our, our time into the darkest night with a heartache kindled into Took a chance when at last I went out unobserved, my house being wrapped in sleep. Uh, okay, Bruce, just for our, our people that are popping in, I know you and we work together and yeah. you teach at Regent. Um, um, what credentials have you got? Why should anybody should give you the next 20 minutes of their time? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I, um, I'm a friend of Steve Bell. How does that do? There you go. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Um, and um, I'm a professional historian and I'm an amateur Christian. And um, I've been sort of reading the classics for a lot of years. And I feel like I'm still plumbing uh, the classics and I read them with my with some fantastic students every year. Mm. And um, and it just I find it deeply nourishing. And one of the books that we've been reading for the last, um, I don't know, maybe seven or eight years every year with students we read uh, some of John's poetry, including mm -hmm. the Dark Knight poem. And then he had these commentaries he wrote on the poems. It's a really interesting way that he did his writing. The mm -hmm. poems came first, and then he wrote these commentaries. And there's a two-part commentary on this poem. And he only really covers about the first two stanzas and one verse of the next stanza. It was called The Ascent of Mount Carmel, and mm -hmm. he was a Carmelite. So it's like going up the mountain of God. And then uh, Dark Night of the Soul is the, the second uh, treatise. And uh, so we read these every year and I find it really interesting because of course it's become almost a meme out there, Dark Night of the Soul. Yep. You know, if you have um, a toothache, it's a Dark Night of the Soul. If, you, um, yep. if you're in a bad mood, it's a Dark Night of the Soul. Um, so initially the presenting question is just what did he mean by all that? But then it just takes you these places. And I just feel like I've just started to, kind of scratch the surface and dig down into John of the Cross. And even in the last couple of years, and partly just reading it with students, I'm just finding some of the more that's there. Well, I find it, what's, what's really interesting is if, again, if you read the poem, you get this very um, uh, lush, yeah. um, it's, uh, what's the word? Um, I mean, it's just, it's, it's very passionate, yeah. uh, very sensual, yeah. Yeah. Um, depending on which translation, quite erotic almost, yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. it, it, and, so here, like, here's here's a question. So if if you went out for coffee with a buddy, and he says to you, Bruce, I stumbled on this song by Steve Bell, Dark Night of the Soul, and you say, I know the song, and uh, he says, Yeah, and I I kind of got it. I mean, it's a love poem, but I, I kind of I can I can tell there's more to it. And I went online, and this was written by a 16th century monk known for asceticism, known for, you know, for yeah. suppressing, famous for how do we suppress passions? And this yeah. is hardly passionless. Yeah. What What's going on here? Like, what what's with Fantastic. That? Fantastic. I think that's one of the central questions that kind of unlocks uh, John of the Cross. And um, I think one of the places to start is to remember that a great love always requires a great fidelity. 
and uh, the faithfulness of lovers is forsaking all others to cleave to you alone. Mm -hmm. And so for John of the Cross, this uh, sense that uh, love itself requires discipline, love needs to be purified, mm. um, that, but it is, as a friend of mine says, it's all about love. Um, <laughs> and, and for John, it really is. Right. But love, there's no love that isn't purified by fire. And that doesn't require a kind of cleansing and rinsing. And, and, and for him, the image is, is, and there's a deep Christian tradition here, but of there's, there's a kind of darkness that we enter. But the, but the beautiful picture he then weaves into that is out of the Song of Songs, it's also in the dark that the lovers meet. The darkness is a place right. of intimacy. It's the night. It's the union of the lover and the beloved in, uh, mm -hmm. in the dark. Um, but so how he works with that is just this, uh, this awareness that um, it's fired, you say, uh, a heartache kindled into love, fired by love's urgent longings is one of the ways that the, one of the yeah. translations of the poem is, um, I'm somehow aware, I am made for a love that is beyond the walls of this world, I am made hmm. for a love affair with God that transcends all other loves. Right. Uh, but this very love requires entering into a kind of darkness. And mm -hmm. when he comments on these poems, um, he says that there's both a darkness of our senses, our sensual attachments are disordered, and there's a way that our appetites are disordered, uh, our relationship, think about today, our relationship to food, our relationship to sex, our, our, uh, but there's a way all our appetites are disordered right. and they need to be purified, cleansed, rinsed, and made able to walk in holiness among the things of the world. Yeah, and then a, also an interior sense, like our, our mind and our thinking and all of that needs to be cleansed. So that's the way, that's the sort of direction he goes is outside in, that allows this love to blossom, right? Hmm. He uses, um, like, you, you get these words that we don't use anymore, uh, purgation, mortification. It's pretty dour, right? Like, it, again, mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. and, and how that sort of feels like it's not, how does that fit with this beautiful poem of, ex, of extravagant sensuality? Mm -hmm. You know, but but it's interesting. Like, I, I looked up just, I, and I know what the word means, but I just looked up purgation, um, uh, from which, you know, means purify, um, cleanse, purge, and then evacuation of the bowels. <laughs> was... Thanks for that, Steve. <laughs> I gotta get so... that out of my mind when I read the but, poem. But you know, yeah. I guess, I guess, when you if you think about us being, you know, broken people, and that yeah. that everything we approach, we approach with a brokenness that that will yeah. soil or sully or um, uh, uh, disfigure the other. Yeah, yeah. Then, then I mean, I guess, I guess I'm asking the question: Is that what he's talking about? Like, how do I, in a sense, cleanse or mortify those things, or or um, uh, put them back in their place? Or that's exactly what it is. It's very um, goes back to Augustine, but the idea that the whole task is for of life is for our loves to be reordered. Right. We love everything in the right way in the right. Um, you know, God first, we love Christ first. Mm. And in fact, his love then comes, and John has this idea too, that there's an active and a passive side to this. The passive side is, you say, I took a chance. Sometimes the poem says, ah, the sheer grace, there's mm. something that comes to us and God's love comes to us and does this purifying work. But I think it's that sense that we all have that we actually, we want to be clean. We want uh I think the language we would use today is we're aware of so many addictions mm -hmm. uh, that when we love things in the wrong way, they enslave us. The biblical right. tradition is of idolatry. Anything you love where in the way that you should love God, you end up anything you worship as an idol, it enslaves you. And today we understand that maybe as addictions and ways or attachments, uh, right. attachments that become disordered. And so we actually, I think, deeply human to want to be cleansed and want to be clean, have all my, all my powers and all my senses rinsed, clean, to walk in innocence. The last line that you pick up yeah. on in the poem is among the lilies there. Among the lilies. And of yeah. course, the lily is the image of the Virgin Mary. And oh, it's, I, it's, it's virginal purity and it's chasteness. And the idea is a kind of hmm. a cool morning innocence to be back in Eden. And so for all that his stuff goes very um, ascetical, 
Yeah. And it can be very, some of it's very severe and some of it talks about nada, 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 nothing, nothing. And just, and it seems like, is this just a discarnate flight of the alone to the alone and leaving creation behind? Mm -hmm. But by the end, it's like you return to all the gifts of creation with cleansed senses. And you're mm. able with a kind of Edenic uh, purity to be able to embrace the things of creation without distorting them, without manipulating them. <laughs> yeah. without... And at the end of his life, he was yeah. down in Andalusia in some of the most beautiful places in Spain. And, and he, he um, um, you know, so the, the imagery, he's partly reflecting back He's reflecting the, the imagery reflects where he lived and dwelt in the last third of his life, but it also reflects back on some um, amazing experiences he had that were truly dark nights and some of what he went through himself. And some of that's part of what he's capturing in here too. Do you know the story about his imprisonment? Well, I, I mean, just from little little biographies. So we should yeah. go with that. I, I, yeah. I like to ask about, I guess, but I do want to be, before we go into that, I just want to highlight, I, th I think one of my desires in my life yeah. is that is to even, you know, how do I love my grandchild with the purest love that hurts her the least? Yes, yes. How do I love my wife, yes. um, you know, with, yeah. with the purest love that hurts her the least? Yeah. A uh, prayer, pr uh, prayer of Jabez, that I may not cause pain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I think you do realize, and I think I think this is common. I mean, I think we all know that we, we, we in a sense, we, we are, we're contagious. We, we, um, yeah. You know, and I, I've been reading a lot lately um, in, the, in the, the story of Mark or, or yeah. the gospel of Mark, you know, but that Jesus in, is, is, a sense is, is a reversal of contagion, mm -hmm. that Jesus mm -hmm. cleanses what he touches. He doesn't, get, mm -hmm. can, he doesn't get sullied by what he touches. I'm reading the gospel of Mark too right now, and it seems like everywhere he goes, it's like there's this light. Yeah, it's like there's this pool of light around him that's just spreading. You yeah, know? it goes that way yeah. rather than, yeah. and, and I just yeah. sort of like in, 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 the, in the Hebrew sort of way of thinking, everything... Uh, dirtied you. Everything made yeah. you unclean. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then Jesus comes along, and it just—it's it, like the tidal bore. It reverses. Yeah, You're nice, and, nice. You know, it's—it's yeah. it's kind yeah. of a—it's a kind of a neat yeah. thing. So yeah. I guess, right, for listeners or who are listening right now, the the the, the darkness or the um, the austerity or um, the nada nada, the saying no to the passions, or you know, it's yeah. work. It's but it's so that love yeah. flow um, yeah. more, yeah. not less. Exactly. And actually, he's very clear, too, that um, that the that the sense of darkness, it's not it's not that there's any darkness in God, that we sort of enter into a God who is all dark. The darkness is um, it's an awareness that we are not holy mm -hmm. and we encounter one who is holy. We are finite and God is infinite. And so it's like there is um, there is a. Um, something that suspends us when we mm -hmm. encounter, if we really encountering God, there's a sense of vertigo, there's a sense of disorientation, there's a sense of, it's like the very center of an icon of a transfiguration in the Greek um, icon tradition is dark, behind right. Jesus it's dark, because there's an awareness that Jesus really reveals God, but as we, as we, if it's really God that we get to know, we can't take in all that light. So he's very clear that it's actually an excess of light that creates darkness. <laughs> so it's like, it's not, it's not really that we enter into some kind of, you know, we just, God is just, you know, unknowing, but yeah. it's more that in us, because we are not holy, we need to be cleansed because we are not infinite. And it's really God that we want to know. We need to allow, a, allow ourselves to stand in a place of vertigo where we are lost in wonder, love and praise, where we realize that, my mind cannot grasp him. My imagination cannot form proper images of him. No amount of intentionality can reach him. It's got to be faith in my intellect, um, walking by faith, not by sight. It's mm -hmm. got to be hope in my memory and my imagination, who hopes for what he has seen. It's got to be love in my will, because whom having not seen, we love. So there's all this awareness that we actually don't, our human powers are not enough to grasp God, mm -hmm. but by his grace, he comes. And his whole vision, I think, is, is actually humanist. It's a deep Christian humanism. It's that the human person uh, 
when we have the very presence of God, the union of lovers in the poem, mm -hmm. that that actually completes the human being. The uh, one is able to engage with material objects without distorting them, without hurting my grandchild, mm -hmm. without hurting you know people around us. And actually all my powers, which for in his period, psychology would be memory, reason, and will, all these interior powers are they're enabled to be what they are because God is there. Right. God is there. And so it's, mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it's actually, I think in the end, even though it talks a lot about negation, it's about a real humanism. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of asceticism that makes us more deeply human and restores to us all the gifts of creation and all our human powers uh, being what they ought to be when um, there is the union of lovers in the dark uh, abandoning all wretched cares among the lilies there mm -hmm. you know, that's yeah. that's where we become human hmm. Hmm. okay uh, let's talk about john uh, you're, okay. you're gonna you're gonna give me a little bit of a history but i kind i kind of know the general story but okay I'm sure you, I'm sure okay you know more than i do well this is where i i, I you know i kind of can, can nerd out on the history but he um He's born in Counter-Reformation Spain, and so for centuries there had been efforts. The church, everybody knew the church needed to be more reformed, and there were attempts from the top down and the bottom up, and so on. And when he is born, um, it's about four. When he's about four years old, Luther dies. So the Lutheran oh, Reformation okay. is going on already. Right. Yep. Uh, when he is born, you know, Calvin's writings are starting to make their way in the world. Henry VIII is um, nationalizing monasteries in uh, England. And so all of this stuff is going on. It's a tumultuous time, and it's, but it's also Spain's, the golden age, they say in Spain. So in England, you know, or in English speaking world, we would look back maybe to the age of Shakespeare as a kind of golden oh, okay. age. Right. So you need to think of John coming to maturity at, you know, it's the Spain of Ferdinand and Isabella. It's like a the powerful, this is Spain at its highest point. Columbus has gone overseas and you have, you know, the beginning of the expansion of Spain overseas. You have um, Cervantes writing, you know, as a kind of Shakespeare for them, you know, mm -hmm. the, the Spanish language. You have um, great artists will be coming on the scene like Blesquef painting, um, uh, wonderful religious paintings. But the very center as the Catholic church itself is seeking to reform itself at this time, not just the Protestant Reformation. They've got stuff going on doctrinally, Council of Trent, and practically to reform the ministry. But the heart of the spiritual renewal is in Spain. And the heart of the spiritual renewal is revolves around uh, Ignatius Loyola and the Jesuits, right. uh, Teresa of Avila. She's about, who's a, an actual contemporary? A contemporary and yeah. close friend. And she's actually, you can't think about John without thinking about her right. and John of the Cross. And these three figures um, join in the whole reform movement as it's going on in Spain, which is controversial, which is difficult and so on. But they have an enormous and lasting impact on Catholic and indeed uh, Christian spirituality mm -hmm. that comes out of this period. So that's, that's sort of part of the historical context. In, um, and indeed, the literature, the poetry of John and some of the writings of Therese are considered sort of classics of the Spanish language, just in terms of language and literature. Right. Um, yeah. The loftiest poet of Spain. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. Castile, um, sort of uh, central, north central Spain, north of Madrid, the first two thirds of his life are in that area. Last third of his life is in Andalusia in the south. Um, he is, the important things probably to know is he is dirt poor and he experiences grinding poverty as a, as a, as a child. Hmm. So his, uh, his father kind of married down, married a, a woman who is weaver class, sort of a textile, uh, home textiles, and, uh, and his family disowned him. For, for marrying down. Oh, okay. And then by the time John is about three years of age, his father dies and you have a single mom with three kids and, um, and they are desperate, absolutely desperate. Right. It may even be that he had two other brothers. He is the youngest. He's very short, by the way, uh, four, four foot, 11 inches. No, like John of the I, Cross. <laughs> I, I, I've got this image of him being like a tall drink of water. Yeah, you know, yeah I did too. Slowly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or the Spanish. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my yeah. goodness. Yeah. No, he's a little guy. 
<laughs> and um, but he had two brothers, yep. and it may even be that his middle middle brother died of starvation. Like it's uh, oh, that, it's that it was that really grim. Poor. And they went for a while to to you know from Fontiveros where he was born down to Toledo with some relatives, and and one of his brothers, his older brother, was abused, and and I mean it's just horrific stuff went on. They end up in Medina when he, by the time he's about nine years old. And uh, he's basically in a kind of orphanage. I mean, it, and, and his mother is kind of making her way. And um, he's learning a little bit, an orphanage school. And they, they're trying to train people for trades to give them something to do. And he doesn't seem to be very, you know, suited to any of these trades. And they ended up getting him working at the hospital. And basically, Steve, this hospital is for people with contagious diseases and his gentleness, he was seen to have a gift for nursing people. You need to picture John sort of coming of age as a junior high kid working with people with COVID, right? Oh, okay. Right. right. He's right. working with people who are suffering from communicable diseases. And, um, and then the Jesuits pick him up and they have a school where he learns the classics. And this is the key. So he'll develop a real intellectual and literary aptitude there mm -hmm. with the Jesuits. He ends up, um, by the time he's sort of reaching the end of high school, if you like, early 20s, he becomes a, a monk, becomes a Carmelite, mm -hmm. and uh, goes through what they call his novitiate. So he begins, yep. um, and then he heads off to Salamanca for university for, three, for four years. Right. And he gets a good university education, the sort of liberal arts, it's theology, it's sort of... Um, he earns his chops in sort of scholastic uh, theology. And that really comes through when you read some of his writings, because mm -hmm. you go, this is an amazing poet. I'm going to read his writing. It's going to be a literary experience. And you go, this guy is analytical. And right? it's dry. I mean, it's, yeah. a, it's, it's a shock almost. It's like, okay, there's two authors here. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. And so how he combines those two elements is, yeah. is I mean, it's absolutely fascinating. He, it's like an analytic philosopher and a poet kind of put together. And, and they do, I mean, if you do read his, his, his book, I mean, yeah. I mean there, there, there's there's flowering moments of poetry yeah. in the lines. It's it's clearly there. Yeah. And and I mean, imagery and imagery. Yeah, he, yeah. he he when he gets to key points and needs to explain something, he often turns to some really powerful imagery. Right. And we could talk about some of those. But he um um toward the end of his uni time at university, mm -hmm. so um he's 25 years of age. Mm -hmm. Trying to think, what was Steve Bell doing at 25 years of age? At, um, <laughs> <That> was, <laughs> at, tw <laughs> at 25 years of age, he meets Teresa. Teresa of Avila. Yeah, Teresa of Avila. Yeah. She is 52 years of age. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. I thought so they were more. Oh, I thought they were. Yeah. 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 Okay, She's 52. It. He's 25. And she has been starting this reform movement. And so part of the background here is Spain is all about honor. It's all about status and honor, and it's a shame honor society. Right. And there's a lot of racial tensions. Does that sound like any time mm. we know? Um, a lot of racial tensions because you have Muslims, Jews, and Christians who've all been living in Spain. And after the Reconquista, after Ferdinand and Isabella unite the empire as a Christian empire, there's a lot of suspicion of conversos people who converted from Judaism to Christianity, are they real Christians? Where do they fit? But there's a lot of racial right. tension, racial tension, purity of blood is this huge thing, honor, and part of, and, and then the monasteries had become, um, and this was always a, a challenge with monasteries. They had ended up, their original observances and ideals were quote, mitigated. In mm -hmm. other words, you get, the, the rules get relaxed. They get endowments, mm -hmm. they become wealthy, but all those honor and status things being high status or low status are reproduced in the monastery. Mm -hmm. And then most of the day is taken up with liturgical prayer, like morning to night. Mm -hmm. And so the way the reform direction went with Teresa, it's like, first of all, small houses, you have to think almost like a community house, 12 women. Mm -hmm. And she was ruthless about no honor or status within the convent. We are only Christ is his majesty. He's the only one who's honored. The rest of us are friends. Hmm. And so wherever it seemed like honor and status were reasserting itself, she just shut it down. It didn't matter who you were in the world. When you join this community, we're friends. Wow. And, um, and it was a return to simplicity. They called themselves discalced 
which means unshod barefoot. And so they weren't going to live on endowments. They were going to live on donations like Steve Bell. And, um, <laughs> and they're going to just, they're, they weren't going to, um, they're going to live would simply. She been, would she have been influenced by Clara? The Franciscans were a huge influence. Okay. A huge influence, the whole Franciscan tradition. I don't know about Claire herself, but, um, and there's a huge Franciscan background within Spain. There had been, so I described how the monasteries had become kind of rigid, more wealthy, and a part of the whole status culture. Um, there were these movements going on that Teresa was a, a part of. The um, Recogidos, um, I'm not pronouncing that right, but there was this movement towards interior prayer. Uh, but then there was this extreme version of it, the Alambrados, that were like crazy charismatics. They were just seeking experiences and funky experiences, mm -hmm. and there were sexual scandals and immorality. And all of all over top of all of this, the Inquisition is trying to sort this all out and shut stuff down. So it took a lot of courage for Teresa to push for these reforms, because anytime you're pushing against vested privilege and pushing against uh, money and status and power, um, there are people who didn't want this to happen or, or that threatened their privileges, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the reform movement, but at the center of it was prayer. Okay. And the idea that it isn't gonna be all just about verbal uh, written prayers all day, but we're gonna take time for private prayer, interior prayer, what they called mental prayer. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna make sure there's time for that every day and that the primary calling is to prayer. Well, John met her and he was captured by her ideals. And uh, he became a priest, he became, um, he, he joined her for uh, a time to kind of learn. And then he became the key, the first of the male Discalce Carmelites and joined her as the one who would help establish um, uh, convents or monasteries for men they were part of this movement and part of this uh, ideal and uh and they had a she she thought he was fantastic she had a huge respect for him for his learning and what he could add to the the movement and um so he went off um a little uh, i think Teresa had a farmhouse or something where he established a community for men with this ideal um then she's in avila and he comes for a period, I think it's 1572 to 77 in his, uh, he's from about 30 to 35 years of age. He actually comes, and this is their closest um, relationship for five years, he is her spiritual director and he becomes her director. And so even though he learned from her originally, mm -hmm. he becomes her director for five years and the director for the other um, discalced Carmelites in, um, in, her in Avila. Right. And it's during that time, he also paints a famous picture. If you Google it, I don't know, maybe you've seen it, the picture of the cross from above. From above, yeah. That Salvador Dali kind of yeah. rests on it later. Yeah, yeah. 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 It, it, and and I, I, I did actually read a little article about this once, and apparently yeah. it was quite revolutionary. Like nobody mm -hmm. had sort of even thought to do that perspective. That perspective. Yeah. So it changed art. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So he... Um, so he's a spiritual director par excellence. Mm -hmm. He is somebody, and uh, Teresa said, if you find a good spiritual director, it's one in a million. She had a bunch of really bad ones. And, um, but that's a time where they are, uh, it's a kind of golden period, a kind of sweet period, I think, in his biography. She is in her 60s. She would be starting to write her interior castle, which would be her masterpiece. Mm -hmm. And, um, She's written some of her life. She's had a number of experiences in prayer, ecstatic experiences, but she really understands the whole of our interior life to be like a castle, because if it's mm -hmm. where God dwells, it must be capacious. Mm -hmm. In my house are many mansions. Yeah. And so the soul, we're bigger on the inside than on the outside. It's the yeah. total opposite of the modern view of the self. Yeah. Charles Taylor says we have a punctual self reduced to a point uh, drained of transcendence. But for Teresa, the whole our insides are bigger than our outsides and it's where God dwells. Anyways, this is, she, but she also has a lot of unusual experiences. She needs to discern. So she has a director. John is her director. Um, but stuff is roiling. You need to picture 
um, people are upset about the, the spread of this movement. They have maybe 300 people now involved in this new movement, and it's threatening the sort of power and privilege of the traditional Carmelites that have mitigated their observance. Mm. They're, um, they have some ecclesiastical authority that has sort of given them cover and allowing the movement to proceed. But then there's a council in Italy in Piacenza. And uh, sorry if I'm going into too much detail, but there's a I'm, big... I'm in. Okay. Yeah, yes, yes, I'm in. <laughs> there's a big council in Piacenza mm -hmm. and uh, for the whole order. And they decide to shut down the whole reform movement. Just boom. It's like word from Italy, reform yeah. movement is going to shut down. So what do they do? There's a papal nuncio, so a representative of the papacy who is saying, no, the reform keeps going. So the conflict here is within the order, they're saying, shut it down. But the higher authority, they feel the papacy is saying, no, continue. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the situation. 1577, John is about 35 years of age in Avila. And the nasties, the, uh, the, the Carmelites who, uh, who don't want this reform, from the richest of, the, of their monasteries in Toledo, they come and they kidnap John. December the 2nd, 1577, they kidnap him and they take him south of Madrid to Toledo and they, imprison, they, they have a trial. It's a bit, almost a mock trial. Mm -hmm. And they, they trot out the, um, um, you know, the, the decisions of Piacenza. They condemn him. And he says, no, we cannot stop the reform. And it's done under proper authority. And they put him in a prison cell. And Steve, I'm a bit claustrophobic. So this kind of thing freaks me out. It was six feet by 10 feet. Okay. And um, no windows except high, high in the wall, a little slit that was just two inches wide that got a little bit of light from the adjoining room. For nine months, he had no change of clothes. And um, he had lice. It was uh, dank, dark, freezing cold in winter through December, January, baking hot in the summer. They gave him water, bread, little salty fish. By the end of the nine months, he was almost like he was nearing approaching death. Like mm -hmm. he was emaciated and approaching death. They flogged him. I, I read one account. They flogged him oh. daily. They brought him out, whipped him. And um like, this is just horrifically traumatic, abusive. What does that do to a person? You know, to compare the, the greater to the lesser, um, as I say, I'm a bit claustrophobic. And uh, last week I had to go get an MRI. Right. And I, yeah. I, I, I hadn't prepared myself for what this was going to be like, because they put you so deep in this thing and it is all around you like this, right? Yep. And I thought, I can't do this. And they pulled me out. My heart's beating. Mm -hmm. And I said, let me try again. And I went in, kept my eyes completely closed, but I just recited um, everything I've ever memorized in my life and, <laughs> and uh, psalms and canticles and hymns. Didn't open my eyes, but it was like I was able to calm down. And it is like a sort of space opened up. And anyway, I think that's what happened to John because he composed, I think it was 27 or 29 of the stanzas of his poem, The Spiritual Canticle, right. he composed there. And now, he, now we've been talking about no piece of paper. This is all... That's all mental. After yeah. two months, there was a new jailer who passed him some paper, and he was able to write down a few okay. things. Um, he had a breviary, like a little prayer book. Mm -hmm. that he would hold up to the light and try to read a little bit. But basically, and there's other stories like this of people when in these... Hmm awful imprisonments who find a kind of inner freedom. Hmm. I yeah. think what happened there is in the darkness and the confinement, um, he, he experienced something inside him open up and he experienced love and the touch of divine glory and light. Mm -hmm. And there was an interior spaciousness that, um, you know, he had to be traumatized. But he, you know, people talk these days about resilience. There was something inside him that I think was able to get through that. And, um, and so some of the lines, um, even in your version here, um, I was uh, thinking of, um, 
um, you know, reflect uh, that sense of to discover in the barren dark. In the barren dark, yeah. The one I knew so well. I think that's what happened to him there. And this, he didn't talk, he didn't like to talk about it, but that had to be the, the turning point in his life, 35 mm -hmm. years of age to go through this. Well, he, um, <laughs> when he's on the point of death, uh, instead of giving in to death, which is probably what I would do, just mm -hmm. despair mm -hmm. and die, mm -hmm. but he, um, he developed a plan because he was occasionally let out enough to see that uh, for little moments that to see that in the next room, there was a window. And so he loosened the, um, the screws uh, and gradually worked loose the hinges on the door enough that when the guards were away one night, he uh, just banged on this thing and got it to break open, got the door to break open. And then, uh, I mean, this reads like this should be made into a movie, right? Maybe it has been, but he got the bed sheets, tore up bed sheets, tied them together and got up to the window. And there was a hook for a lamp where he tied the bed sheets and let himself down onto this uh, bit of a, a retaining wall, a wall where he could let himself down onto it. And he walked around the wall of the monastery to escape. And then this is the bit this of is, humor. This is the poem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then oh. he tried to escape, right? And mm. then he, um, this is, the, this is the, the bit of humor. He thinks, you know, at the wall, he's at the, the place where he can dip into the city streets of Toledo. Mm -hmm. And he jumps down the wall and he lands in, um, the courtyard of a, Fran a Franciscan nunnery. So he, a Franciscan <laughs> convent. And it's like, oops, I, I, <laughs> I jumped into the wrong place. But he finds some loose um, masonry and is able to climb out up the wall down into the streets of Toledo. And emaciated at the point of death, he finds his way to a treason convent where they take him in and nurse him. They secretly have him at the hospital of Santa Cruz. They have him nurse back to health. And then they have a kind of covert meeting of the reform movement and they send him to Andalusia. And that's where at El Calvario um, in the beauty of the Southern Spanish mountains, he um, starts over again. Hmm. And that's where he writes. That's where he does spiritual direction. And interestingly, he reflects on the poetry. The poetry is the dense, central, spiritual sort of power. And then he reflects on it. Mm -hmm. He teaches at the university, his university teaching he does. He's an organizer. He founds like seven or eight of these monasteries. He, um, Gosh. Um, but, uh, but that's where the writing happens. And that's where he develops the Dark Night of the Soul poem and the commentaries on the poem. But when you when you know what he experienced, mm -hmm. then you know that it's not just a metaphor. Like he actually went through this, right? Right. Wow. Yeah. I mean, the, the, I guess because the 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 poem is so romantic. Yeah. Right. I mean, it, it just really is. I mean, you just always feel like yeah. you're 18 and yeah. you're just in yeah. love with Mary Sue and you can hardly breathe. Yeah. When she yeah. Walks in the room. Yeah. I mean, it's got that. Yeah. yeah. You know that to us. So you yeah. can't really. I mean you can't imagine this is behind it yeah although you you sense something is i mean that's yeah. the thing you just kind of know this is more than just yeah you know, uh, uh, yeah hmm. but what he found i mean isn't it something steve you think about all the brokenness of life and the harsh things that people go through that in the midst of that experience that is dehumanizing what he found was love you know Gosh, yeah what he found mm. was a world of love that um he found an intimacy beyond the walls of the world that sustained him. And he found um, um, to discover in the barren dark, the one I knew so well, and it, uh, it made all the difference, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's why I say, I think, despite all of the talk of negation and darkness and, you know, denuding oneself of mental images and all this kind of right. stuff, it's really about a, a deep Christian humanism about recovering our humanity and that we're not really human until we have met in the dark um, the one we love so well until until we have christ dwelling within mm. and um, renovating transforming our experience of the created world all our uh, sensible life all our interior life when christ is there then um, it's really transfiguring. And I think that's what he, he was ultimately after. It wasn't just negation. You can find that anywhere. 
and um it was something yeah more... yeah this isn't this isn't taming a beast so that you can get it to you know plow your field yeah it's not yeah. that sort of that that cruel you know the the beast has no value um yeah. i have a purpose so i'm going to tame my body so i can accomplish a task yeah. Well, yeah. you know please the deity or 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 whatever it's yeah. it's um it's for freedom right it's, for... it, it's a bit like we both love you and i both love francis of assisi and mm -hmm. it's a bit like in his giving up all things um he receives all things yeah and he can write one of the first and most powerful laude the kind of uh, Italian vernacular poems, all creatures of our God and King and mm -hmm. celebrate creation. It's like you receive it all back again. Yeah. And I think that happened for John. He received hmm. it all back again, you know? Hmm. So what's the gift of the poem for, okay, I, I, I think a lot of people that are watching this or listening to it, um, again, this is, I mean, this, this is a, we don't, we can hardly imagine the world that he was in. Yeah. Um, we we don't really understand. We live in a society that basically feeds every every hunger. Yeah, yeah. you know what I mean. And yeah. and the, yeah. the the way to solve hunger is to feed it. You know, yeah. just to yeah. del deluge it, whether it's yeah. you know, food or sex or experience or or yeah. or whatever. Also, the whole idea that I do things for to discover me. I like yeah. I'm, I am I am the, the 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 subject of everything. Um, so and and everything in our society rewards that so how do you take a poem like this like what what's the discipline of saying how how do we even begin to reverse the title board like to 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 make it go the other direction right? yeah. repent i guess is the word yeah but it seems like even back then i mean at least disciplines or were to somewhat celebrated Mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. they're not in our day except for in sports or something you know yeah that's right we are we are still ascetics yeah. but we have the ascetics of the here and now we exercise self-denial either for the sake of the body beautiful we we want to deny ourselves certain things so that we can be more attractive to the opposite sex mm -hmm. or we deny ourselves things so that we can live a happier more fulfilled longer life mm -hmm. or so like we still have asceticism but it's for the here and now right i think the danger of asceticism or discipline has always been past and present to the deep yeah. just explain for those who don't know the word asceticism just just asceticism is self-denial okay and okay. denying yourself and it's saying no to something good to say yes to something better right so it's not necessarily just rejecting something sinful mm -hmm. we're all called to reject what is sinful uh the world the flesh and the devil but should we sometimes give up sleep hmm. well um I couldn't sleep the night before I got married. Mm -hmm. You know, I kept mm -hmm. vigil because mm -hmm. um, you know, are there times when we um when we might give up food? Mm -hmm. Well, food is good. Mm -hmm. Are there times, are there people who might be called to give up marriage and choose singleness as a vocation? Mm -hmm. These are all forms of saying no to something good for the sake of a higher love, mm -hmm. not because they aren't good but um but in different ways we can say there's a transvaluation of these goods right. Okay. and right so that's um um so but i think the danger with asceticism is always autonomy it could deepen my autonomy it's another means of taking control this mm -hmm. can happen like with eating disorders it's a form of control i need to take control right whereas discipline should extend our availability should make us more available to God. There are things they, in fact, one of the images that John uses, it's interesting, I've used this before in other contexts, but John talks about it's like cleaning a window. Hmm. You know, imagine that you were separated from Nancy, the person you love most in the world, and there's a huge wall that separates you and uh, you can't get to her. And all there is in the wall is a, is a window and uh, that's your only hope of seeing her but the window is covered in grime mm -hmm. well with what love and joy and energy would you clean the window because mm -hmm. with every act of cleaning the vision of your beloved becomes more clear beautiful yeah. that's the sense of asceticism right okay. right fired by love's urgent longings yeah. with a heartache kindled into, into love right. that's yeah. the key otherwise asceticism is just one more attempt to deepen our autonomy and gain control right right fascinating yeah yeah he, about, yeah he uses that image of the of the window and talks about um um 
it's, it talks about the kind of translucence and the sense that when the window is completely clear, you don't even, you don't even see the window anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's part of a way he's saying the light has penetrated the window. You don't even see it anymore. And that's his vision again of our human powers sort of um, flooded with light. Mm -hmm. Can you, can you comment just for a minute? We should, and we should probably let people go. Um, like, like, um, in, in, in our day and age, when this kind of sort of, in a sense, spiritual practice is so foreign, mm -hmm. like we, like, it's, it's like going to another land and you don't, you don't understand the, the symbols, you don't understand, you know, the language, you don't understand, um, uh, the, the, the color schemes are garish to you, you know, like, like all the kind of things, how do you, how do you, if, if, if something of, of this song, say that I've written or the poem itself um, is calling and, and wants to draw somebody, where, where do you start? Like, mm. you know what I'm asking? Like, yeah. I think, um, I think what your version of the poem really helps us to see Steve is, um, I think where we start is with um, is recognizing um, that our deepest desires, if we only knew it, are for worship, and um, our deepest desire is for this union. All the streams of our desires, whatever we think they might be, we think we want to be wealthy or secure mm -hmm. or find love in this world, but all the streams empty into this ocean. Mm -hmm. And I think if we can get in touch with that desire, and uh, that's where the poem begins, it does lead into um, a kind of darkening or purging experience because um, every act of love requires a corresponding act of fidelity. Every mm -hmm. act of saying yes requires saying no. Mm -hmm. And it's that very covenant love. It's the, the covenant commitments it's the desire to say, um, to allow love to purge us and love to mm -hmm. make us clean. Mm -hmm. But what a wonderful thing, you know, mm -hmm. it, um, we're afraid to be judged and found wanting, but to be purified by fire and made clean and made innocent again. I think it begins, I think it begins with these desires and seeing that um, the, sus you know, suspending of my senses, my house being wrapped in sleep, that there comes a point where the raging appetites and the restless mind need to be quiet. And hmm. we need to be aware of what he called the general loving awareness of God's presence. It's like when you go into a room and it's all dark and you somehow know there's somebody in this room. Hmm. And I can't, it's, it's obscure, he says, or, or it's like, if I'm talking away to Carolyn, my wife, Carolyn, and we're chatting away and I'm telling her all the things I love about her and she's compassionate and she's creative and she's so beautiful and she's so funny. And she says, would you just shut up and be with me and hold me? Mm -hmm. That um, to be, have that general loving awareness of the beloved is um, that's where everything starts. Mm -hmm. And then that will, that, that awareness of the beloved and that uh, desire will, um, will lead us, uh, love purifies, you know, he who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself. Mm -hmm. It will lead to, um, um, to um, a process of cleansing because um, the, the, the lover wants the beloved to be clean. Hmm. Hmm. You know, it's funny, like I, I, I put out this new video um, which is why I called you so we could sort of talk about this thing. And I, I haven't really actually thought about the song for quite a while. <laughs> and um, I mean, I, I perform it and I, and mm -hmm. I, you know, I trot out my normal, you know, introductions that I do at concerts and all that kind of fair. But for, for whatever reason, I don't know if, because what we've gone through with, with, you know, COVID um, with uh, the, the Trump years, like all this sort of trauma, like, you know, and you know, this doesn't even, you know, it pales compared to what we've talked about with John of the Cross, but it sort of feels like I am re-engaging this song from a place of trauma that I wasn't in when I wrote it in the first place. Like right. it's a different right. growing with you. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's, there, there's something this, like, um, <laughs> I often find this with my best songs. My, my best songs always become my mentors, yeah. um, you know, and I don't know how to explain that. No, um, I understand. Yeah. But, but I do find that my better work, I, I, I think I write it for my future self um, yeah. from some place yeah. of that I don't actually have. So it, I don't know how to describe all that. Yeah. 
But yeah. I, I find that this song has been waiting for me <laughs> mm. in a sense coming out of um, uh, out of the experiences that we've had. And, and, and with that also is, you know, the death of my father, um, you know, different other things, you know, uh, concerns amongst my kids and grandkids and tragedies and sorrows and fears, all those kinds of things put together. And then also in this song, uh, we put it out again and I just find it sort of saying like, uh, attend, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's something here. Um, and so I'm, I'm happy to put it out again for folks. And, um, and I just want to thank you for kind of setting it for us because we are in, in and coming out of trauma that, yeah. and, and I guess there's a, there, there may be a way of doing it well, yeah. you know, that we don't return to all the same lusty behavior yeah. so that the passions can be cleansed and purified. And so that there can be love without harm. Yeah. Um, yeah, which would be lovely, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, wouldn't that be a, a lovely yeah. thing, you know, that is, that if is. that we could do whatever work that we need to do so that we can nurture love and desire in a way that flourishes the other, not diminishes, and whether it yeah. be, you know, human creation or non-human creation. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's good. Thank you, sir. Thank you, my friend. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> you too. Okay. <laughs> good to chat.
suspending all my senses bless this happy night that unites